Yes, now we are recording. Uh, so, Professor Thomas Pogman, thanks to for you to because your participation is a post-graduation uh, subject at São Paulo State University. It's a uh, a subject on theories of citizenship. I shared this uh, subject with other two colleagues. Uh, one uh, uses an approach from the constitutional law, another from the political science. And the, the part of the subject that uh, I have presented discuss the, the global citizenship, uh, cosmopolitan citizenship. And one of the references that we've been discussing here is your theory on global justice. So it's a great, great honor to receive you in our uh, postgraduate uh, program. Uh, first, I would like to ask to Mateus uh, to, to make a, a very short introduction about, about uh, you and your work. Please, Mateus. Okay. So, Thomas, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, I will first introduce you and next introduce your book and give some points about your ideas and then you can start okay 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 so who is thomas pogi having received his phd in philosophy from harvard supervised by john rouse john rouse wrote uh, this book's uh, theory of justice he is the portuguese version and a lot of people and um and Thomas is a Latin professor of philosophy and international affairs and director of the Global Just Program at Yale. And uh, the last three months I joined Thomas and met him and started to contribute to the Global Justice Program and it was a fantastic experience. And thank you, Thomas, for that again. So the Thomas Manley book is this one called What Poverty and Human Rights, Cosmopolitan Responsibilities and Reforms. Uh, publicated in 2002 and uh, in my point of view what is the main objective of the book is show how the citizens of affluent countries shall respond morally to the global poverty problem so before Thomas uh, speech uh, I think everyone need to have in mind three ideas the first one Thomas is a philosopher who mainly investigates the problem of poverty as a social and justice way. For Thomas, poverty is the result of a deficit of human rights. So Thomas, different of another authors who studied poverty, Thomas think poverty in a way of the deficit of human rights. For example, a person is more or less poor, depend if he has more or less access to human rights human rights on a moral perspective, not only in a legal perspective. The second point I think it's important before I listen to Thomas. Thomas made a diagnosis that a huge part of extreme poverty could be avoided if the global institutional order were designed in a different way. What he mean with this? I think uh, um, the extreme poverty, only the extreme poverty, not the relative poverty, could be solved if reforms in the global order or for Thomas Fink, if we attack the EMF, the WTO, European Union, United States politics, we can resolve a, a huge part of extreme poverty. And uh, what to do to reform, what to Thomas make, what Thomas organize your ideas to prove we can resolve the poverty problem uh, in, a, uh, in a cosmopolitan way. Thomas make a strong moral argument for responsible the citizens of rich countries. These citizens have an, a negative duty, and Thomas can explain this better next, of justice to not sustain the injustice that the governments inflict of the world's poor. So for Thomas, the citizens of the of the 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 the, the, the north, the global north, have a have a duty, have a responsible to solve and to uh, 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 not tolerate the problem of the world poor. So, okay, this is the three points I think it's good to have in mind before Thomas' speech. Thomas, I think I'm right to talk about you to you, but now you can uh, start your presentation. Thank you for coming here. Yeah, and thank you for your nice introduction. 
And uh, this fits very well into the theme of citizenship because this is a central concept for me. What are the responsibilities of citizenship? Not only with regard to the state in which one lives, but also with regard to the foreign policies of that state and with regard to the institutions that that state is helping to shape and impose globally. And here, of course, the responsibility of the United States is particularly great. And I've tried with very little success to uh, get American citizens, US citizens to think more about their, uh, their responsibilities. One other thing I should say, and Mateos, while he was here in the US, reminded me of that, is that, of course, uh, affluent people in developing countries also bear a significant responsibility. I have written less about that because that is something that I'm less of an expert on, but it is certainly something that you as privileged members of Brazil's society uh, will want to think about as you listen to this lecture. So let me start with the US century the U.S. century started in around 1940, 1941, with the U.S. entry into the Second World War. And in January 1941, Roosevelt gave a famous speech in which he envisioned the post-World War order. What does the United States stand for? What does the United States want to achieve after the Nazis and the Japanese have been defeated. Roosevelt dreamed of a world with four freedoms, including freedom from want, which translated into world terms means economic understandings which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants. This is what he thought is the strong suit of the United States. The United States is the country that can create prosperity, not only for itself, but for the whole world. Now, in a sense, that has succeeded. Since 1941, the gross world product has risen 17 fold. This has never happened in the history of humanity that in 80 years, the social product of the world increased by a factor of 17, an unbelievable success. And this success has two components. There is an increase in the human population by a factor of 3.5 from 2.3 to 8 billion people and there is an increase in global income per capita per person by a factor of five. So world income in 2022 was 161 trillion international dollars. International dollars are money in all different countries converted at purchasing power parity. So you don't convert at the bank exchange rate, but you convert at buying power, what the money can actually buy. So the combined purchasing power of all the people in the world is now as much as $161 trillion per year. That works out to $20,000 per person per year or $55 per person per day. So that's the average. And as I said, that's five times what it was in 1941. So we went from $11 per person per day to $55 per person per day. Now, if all the segments of the human population had participated equally in economic growth, then the poorest would now have at least five times as much income as they need to survive. And if you read some of the media, you get a feeling that maybe that is happening. 
So the Economist magazine is celebrating the reduction of poverty that we've had over the last 20, 30 years. And we have to say, however, that pretty much all of that reduction happened in just one country. Two thirds of this reduction in poverty over 25 years happened only in China, if the numbers are to be believed, but these are the official numbers from the World Bank. So the World Bank is admitting that of the 1175 million people lifted out of poverty, 742 million are just Chinese. And of course, the Chinese poverty reduction isn't really a merit of the institutions that the World Bank and the United States have visited upon the world. Here is another one of these optimistic statistics. This is from a YouTube video that Bill Gates and Steven Pinker have made together. You can see how successful we have been in combating hunger. From somewhere around 18% in 1990, we went to almost zero in 2015. The problem is that this is completely invented. This is not true at all. Here you can see the numbers from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And you can see that the hunger numbers have not moved significantly since about 2010. And in recent years, they have been rising. The dark line is the number of people who are undernourished. The orange line is the percentage of people who are undernourished. So it's, if anything, going up. And what we find is nearly 10% are undernourished, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Now, this number is a gross understatement. Here is the way in which the FAO defines undernourishment. This is a new definition that they use to reduce the number of undernourished people. It came into force in 2012. As they themselves explain it, undernourishment has been defined as an extreme form of food insecurity arising when food energy availability also known as dietary energy intake, is inadequate to cover even minimum needs for a sedentary lifestyle for over a year. Now let's look at the four elements in this definition. A person counts as undernourished or hungry by the FAO only if, and here we look at the food that a person ingests, the food that crosses her lips, goes into her mouth. This ignores the fact that in the developing world among the poor, many people have food absorption problems, for example, because of parasites or worms that are living in their intestines. Many people really get only 75% of the nutrition that they ingest into their system because the meal is shared by parasites. The FAO looks only at energy. So it doesn't look at vitamins, it doesn't look at micronutrients, it doesn't look at protein. The only thing that the FAO pays attention to is the number of calories that a person ingests. So that again, is a big mistake that excludes many undernourished and malnourished people from the count of the FAO. The standard the FAO uses is what's needed to cover minimum needs for a sedentary lifestyle. Sedentary means my lifestyle sitting down. So obviously, most people, many people in the developing world do not have the luxury of a sedentary lifestyle. 
They have to work to make their living. They have to fetch water from the river. They have to tend to the fields. They have to uh, drive a bicycle rickshaw. They have to work in construction. So these people often need two times or three times as many calories as would be necessary for a sedentary lifestyle. And finally, the FAO counts you as undernourished only if you fall below the sedentary lifestyle minimum for over a year. This is downright crazy because many people die before a year is up. And so these people are never hungry. They are never undernourished because they have died in 11 months or in nine months or in three months. So the definition of the FAO is absolutely absurd. And nevertheless, it's the official definition which the FAO adopted after it was told that its hunger numbers are too large. Here is how the FAO defends the one year idea. The reference period should be long enough for the consequences of low food intake to de be detrimental to health. Although there is no doubt that temporary food shortage may be stressful, the FAO indicator is based on a full year. So here, what is being said is that if you have insufficient food for less than a year, it's not detrimental to your health. It's detrimental to your health only if you are hungry for more than a year, and then we will count you as undernourished. So the whole exercise of the FAO is pretty bogus. I wrote a scathing essay about that in 2016, and the FAO has now given, given new numbers that calculate the number of people who could not afford a healthy diet. Now, this new statistic shows that 42% of the world's population, 80% of all people in Africa, could not or cannot afford a healthy diet in 2020 due to the cost of the diet. You can see here that the cost of a healthy diet is calculated at $3.54. This is again international dollars. So you need $3.54 to be able to afford a healthy diet. Uh, it would be quite difficult to do that in the US today, but that's what the FAO is assuming. And as I told you earlier, $55 is the average income in the world. So 42% of the world's population cannot afford a healthy diet that costs $3.54, while the average income in the world is $55. So to summarize, the average human income has increased fivefold to $55, 42% of humankind are unable to afford a healthy diet at an average cost of 354 international dollars. Now the tendency is it's getting worse. You can see here also from the FAO, the prevalence of food insecurity, which has been going up each and every year since 2014. So we are always told that the food problem in the moment, which is very severe, is because of Ukraine and because of COVID-19. But really, the food insecurity has been going up consistently for much longer than that. I think it has something to do with the SDGs that after the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, were replaced by the Sustainable Development Goals, politicians relaxed. They said, ah, we have until 2030 to make progress 
against the sustainable development goals. So let's relax for a few years and let the successor politicians worry about getting rid of poverty and hunger. The very latest numbers are terrible. You can see here in the last one and a half years, food prices have skyrocketed. They have gone up very significantly. And so the food situation is much worse now than what I have described. I've told you 42% of the world's population cannot afford a healthy diet. That number today is significantly higher in 2022 because food prices went up by one third. Other poverty parameters are similarly awful. You can see here lack of access to essential medicines, lack of safe drinking water, lack of adequate shelter, lack of electricity, lack of adequate sanitation, illiteracy, and child labor. So very large numbers of human beings, uh, billions of them in fact, lack all these human rights guaranteed minimum necessities. Now, when you say this to people in the developed West, my compatriots, they say, oh, but things have gotten better. Now, my response to that is they haven't gotten better in the last eight years. And moreover, we should compare, morally speaking, the status quo, not with the status quo of some earlier time, but with what would be possible today. So I think it's a moral mistake to say that a situation is okay because it's better than it was. It's not okay for a husband to beat his wife, for example, if he does it less often than he did in prior years. Nor is it okay if millions of people are starving, if that number is smaller than how many people were, sm were starving in earlier years. We have to compare with what is possible and clearly, if the average income in the world is $55, then it's clearly possible for everybody to be given access to a healthy diet, which costs only $3.50 per person per day. So if you think about comparing 1941 to today, you would say we are actually doing much, much worse than in 1941 because avoidable poverty is so much greater. In 1941, a lot of severe poverty was not avoidable. The world wasn't rich enough at $11 per person per day. But today at $55 per person per day, on average, we are rich enough easily to eradicate all severe poverty. So this draws our attention to inequality. The fact that the world is rich in aggregate, $55 a day, and that so many people are suffering very severe poverty, that draws attention to inequality, disparities in income and wealth, intertwined with social and political inequalities. Here we have to distinguish between national, international and global inequality. National inequality has gotten worse almost everywhere, dramatically worse in China, in Russia, in India, in the United States, in Great Britain, not so much in Brazil, interestingly, because your inequality was off the charts already. You had high inequality for a long, long time. And so it hasn't gotten really worse, but it's remained very bad. International inequality has improved in recent years because China and India have caught up with the rich countries. They have grown faster than the richest countries. 
but global inequality, inequality among individuals and households worldwide has also worsened in particular because the top 1% has become much, much richer. So here is the latest data on inequality. You can see that in income, the top 1% of the world's population have 19% of income and 38% of all wealth. And the bottom 50%, the people that we are talking about when we talk about poverty, have 8% of all global income and only 2% of all global wealth. And that is, of course, the problem. We have to get that number up. Here is a distribution, the global income distribution. It looks nice on the surface, like a normal distribution, but you have to remember that this is a logarithmic scale. So what we have here is the average income, $55 per day. That is quite far to the right. And you can see here that a few people, 6%, who have more than $55, they drag the average up and the other 94% live below the average income. Here's the $5 per day threshold. That is what you need to afford a healthy diet. So you spend $3.50 to buy food and the other $1.50 on housing and all the other needs, clothing and so forth. So with $5 a day, you could more or less afford a healthy diet. And you can see that 42% of the world's population are unable to do that in the year 2020. So I want to conclude here that the global poverty problem is very large in human terms, much larger than most people in the West recognize. If you ask people, they will say misled by the World Bank and by the FAO, they will say poverty has become a very small problem. Not many people are poor anymore, at least not seriously poor. So that is false. Very large numbers of human beings are very severely poor, roughly half the human population. The other thing that is surprising is that the global poverty problem is small in economic terms, despite the fact that it is so large in human terms. Economically, we just need to shift a few percent of global income from the rich to the poor in order to eradicate the problem. Now, when you get Westerners to this point, they will start talking about assistance. You are right, we should do more to help the world's poor. And so we have a lot of movements now that are talking about assistance and some that are actually doing something about it. So you have individual gifts to charities, you have official development assistance, which the West has promised would reach 0.7% of gross national income but it's still only at 0.32% on average. You have the SDGs, you have remittances, which are people from developing countries sending money home to their friends and relatives. Rawls is talking about a duty of assistance in his book, The Law of Peoples. And you have talked about a responsibility to protect, R2P. So a lot of talk, a little bit of action, nowhere near enough, but everything is framed in the language of assistance. Singer's effective altruism movement belongs there also. Now, the background to that is a popular view called explanatory nationalism. Explanatory nationalism says that in the post-colonial era, the causes of the persistence of severe poverty lie within poor countries themselves. 
you find that almost every week in The Economist magazine, you find it announced by the World Bank, you find it in Rawls's book, The Law of Peoples. It's a very common view. And there is an argument for the view. The argument is that there is great variation in how the former colonies have evolved over the past 60 years. Their strongly divergent national trajectories must be due to different domestic causal factors in the countries concerned. So you say China has done very well. Many African countries have done poorly. Korea has done very well, and so on. Haiti has done very poorly. So obviously, there must be national factors that explain the difference. It cannot have anything to do with global institutional arrangements with the way we organize the world economy. Now, here is a parallel argument that shows how stupid the first argument is. I teach classes at Yale University and at the end of the semester, which is very soon, we find that there are great variations in the performance of my students. Some have learned a lot and some have learned very little. So we conclude that this must be due to student specific factors and it, learning has nothing to do with the teacher nothing to do with the classroom, nothing to do with the teaching materials, and so on. That would obviously be a big and stupid mistake. Obviously, it has something to do with the teacher. If I were a better teacher, then all my students would learn more. Also, if I chose different teaching styles and different teaching materials, then maybe some of my students would do better than now and other students would do worse because my style and my materials are more suitable for some students and less suitable for other students. So, of course, student specific factors matter, just as national factors matter in poverty eradication, but it doesn't follow from that that global factors are irrelevant. Global factors also matter a lot. And depending on the global economic order, some countries will thrive and other countries will do very poorly. And of course, we've seen that, that for example, resource rich countries have done very poorly in the global economic order that the United States and its allies have created. So let's try another explanation of persistent poverty and another response to it. This is the claim that I've been defending in World Poverty and Human Rights and in other writings. I claim that severe poverty is reproduced by unjust national and international structures that require reform. And that gives us as citizens negative duties duties to stop harming. Those are negative duties. We have to stop harming and the harming that we do now is through the design and upholding of institutional arrangements that foreseeably and avoidably perpetuate and aggravate severe poverty. So the relationship of poverty to inequality is twofold. There is a mathematical relationship that the income and wealth of the poor is basically the average income multiplied by their relative income wealth share. The poor are now reduced to a very small percentage of the average income and so despite the fact that the average income is quite high, $55 per person per day, nevertheless, poor people cannot feed their families. And that is almost half the human population. There's also a political relationship, and this is now important. 
the more poor households fall below the average, the less powerful they are politically, the more underrepresented they are. They have to live hand to mouth. They have no time to engage in politics and they have no ability to engage in politics because that requires not only time but also resources. So poor people are politically marginalized. The poorest countries are politically marginalized. And so unsurprisingly, institutional arrangements, global institutional arrangements are made while ignoring the needs of the world's poorer half. So we have two causes of extreme inequality. We have initial conditions of extreme inequality that resulted from the colonial period. In 1997, the gap between the 20% of the people living in the richest countries and the 20% of the world's people living in the poorest countries was 74 to 1. So an enormous gap that, of course, manifests itself in an enormous gap in political influence. And this political influence then affects all the different structures of national societies and most importantly, of the world at large. These structures include the institutional order, all the legally codified rules and practices of politics, diplomacy, and so on. Basically, treaties, international conventions, and so on. Then the various social and cultural practices, customs and habits, of production, consumption, diplomacy, and so forth. The material infrastructure, roads, railways, shipping lanes, and all that. And then the material environment as shaped by how we interact with it. All these structural features of our world are deeply shaped by human beings. And here, those who are more powerful and richer have a great advantage in shaping these structures. And of course, they shape these structures to their own advantage. Here we find something that economists have much discussed under the title of regulatory capture. It's a feature of competitive systems that are omnipresent in the business world, financial markets, academia, everywhere, we have competitive systems or adversarial systems nowadays where people compete for success. Such systems are very efficient if they are properly framed and proper framing is achieved when the sought rewards are highly correlated with socially valuable outcomes. But this requires that the rules of the competition are suitably designed, transparently and impartially administered. And here comes the problem. The problem is that in a competitive system, there are two ways of getting ahead. You can either get ahead by doing what the system says it will reward, doing it well and better than others, and then being rewarded. Or you can get ahead by trying to manipulate either the rules of the system, the rules of the competition, or the application of these rules. And once that happens, of course, then the rules and the personnel structuring and constraining the competition themselves become part of the competition or objects of the competition. We are trying to influence the rules or we are trying to influence the uh, people who administer the rules. Of course, you have had a beautiful example of that with all the corruption in Brazil 
where big corporations like Odebrecht and so on were trying to win the competition not by providing good goods and services that are excellent, but by bribing politicians and changing the rules of the competition or the application of those rules. This is the Achilles heel of competitive systems, very well discussed and understand, understood in economic analysis. So competitive systems lose much of their effectiveness when you can engage in this kind of regulatory capture behavior. Resources that should be invested in doing well in the competition are in fact invested in lobbying. And in so far as lobbying is successful, the success of the system is diminished because inferior products and inferior services win the competition and get rewarded and the really good products and good services are not successful. So what we can get here is inequality spirals. Regulatory capture makes social systems vulnerable in this way. The strongest participants, those who are already the richest and best resourced, they have great opportunities and incentives to achieve the expertise and the coordination that is, are needed for effective regulatory capture. They use these opportunities to expand their relative position and then they use their increased influence to shift the rules and their application even further in their own favor. So you get an inequality spiral. A company or an individual gets rich, invests that money in lobbying and thereby becomes even richer. And in the end, that is to the detriment of the social benefits that the system is supposed to produce. An economy is supposed to satisfy human needs. And our economy, the world economy, is doing very, very poorly at that, leaving 50% of the world's population in severe poverty because it has been captured by a small number of rich people and rich corporations. They don't hate the poor, but they love themselves much more. And so they use their lobbying power to shape the system for their own benefit so that they capture as large as possible a share of the global economic product. Severe poverty is a side effect of this concentration of wealth and power at the very top. Here's some evidence that lobbying really works. So uh, there was a firm that gives investment advice and it came up with an idea about how to win in the stock market. You invest in the 50 S&P 500 companies, the biggest companies in the United States stock market. You invest in those 50 companies that spend most money on lobbying as a percentage of their assets. And sure enough, those companies that could spend money on successful lobbying, those companies outperformed the S&P 500 by a very large margin, by somewhere around 11% per year. So not every company has the opportunity to lobby, but those companies that can lobby, that can spend money on lobbying and do so, those companies are much more successful than other companies. Here's another interesting article by three economists that looked at lobbying expenditure to pass a certain piece of tax legislation in the United States. The brief story is that a tax cut for corporations was passed in the US and that tax cut 
was lobbied for by a small number of corporations, about 70 corporations. They put together money to give to the political parties to pass that act, the Republican Party in particular. And for every one dollar that these companies invested in lobbying, they got $220 back in tax reductions. So an incredible return of 22,000% on their investment. Very lucrative lobbying. Now, one very cost-effective lobbying in recent decades has been lobbying to change global institutions. This is much ignored, has not been scientifically studied very much, but is a very interesting topic. Uh, this lobbying tries to shape the design of supranational global structural features. So here you go through the WTO, the G20, the European Union. You really are, you as a corporation or rich individual, you are lobbying your own government, mostly the US government, but you are lobbying the US government not with regard to domestic policy, but with regard to global rules. You try to enlist the US government in your support to change the international rules of the game in your own favor. And this effort has been extremely successful. So more and more things are now regulated at the global level. My primary example is intellectual property rights, which are now globalized. And as these global rules become more and more important, those players, those corporations and individuals who can influence those rules can make enormous profits. And very few are in a position to do that. Only the richest banks, hedge funds, corporations, industry associations and individuals are able to influence this global rule making. And they have been absolutely incredibly successful in the period since the founding of the WTO. And here the most promising avenue of success is to lobby the US government because nowhere in the world is politics for sale as much as in the US where campaigns are privately funded and where you essentially have a one dollar one vote system. At the latest election which has just concluded here consumed more than 16 billion dollars and of course, that all came from lobbyists who expect something in return for their money. So globalization, which is the upward shift of rulemaking powers from the national level to the supranational level, is partly explained by the fact that economic elites can exert much more influence on political decisions at the global level than at the national level, ironically. So US corporations have more influence on global rulemaking than on US rulemaking. And there are reasons for that. At the global level, there is no democracy. There is no democratic counterweight. There is no transparency, even exposed. Right? Governments get together, they make a decision, they announce the decision, but you can never find out which government argued for this or for that particular piece in the final treaty that was adopted. You get the treaty text and the governments afterwards will say, well, we did the best we could, we tried to make the best deal we could make, but there's no transparency, no accountability of governments for what was decided. And then there is morality. In the domestic realm, morality is a pretty powerful force. If something is clearly immoral, it's difficult to pass it through the parliament. 
But in the global realm, it's much easier. In the global realm, you say that international relations are a jungle. We are competing with the Chinese, we are competing with the Russians, with all sorts of unsavory people, the Americans for that matter, the US. So we have to play hardball, we have to be tough. We cannot afford to compete with these rivals with one hand tied behind our backs. We have to leave morality aside in international relations and get the most advantageous deal we can get. And so here too, morality is not much of a restraint in international relations and rules are adopted internationally that are very clearly deeply unjust like, for example, the intellectual property rules. So here are some examples of rules that are clearly beneficial to the rich and the rich countries, the rich corporations, the rich individuals, and are totally unjust. Intellectual property rights, which prevent half of the human population from getting access to drugs, medicines, vaccines, that can be mass produced very, very cheaply. But they get no access because of patents, monopolies. Natural resource sovereignty. So buyers of natural resources pay the dictators in resource rich African countries. The dictators get rich and buy themselves the soldiers and weapons they need to stay in power. And the population of those countries, they lose their resources and they find their dictators and tyrants strengthened by the money that is paid not to the people, but to the rulers. No liability for externalities. The rich countries are polluting like crazy, are creating a climate disaster, are creating air pollution, soil pollution, water pollution, the poor populations do not contribute to that disaster, but they are the main people getting harmed by it. And the rich countries are refusing to pay for the damages. At COP27, they have now said, okay, we'll maybe pay a little bit, but so far there are no details and no payments. No labor standards. So there is a race to the bottom where poor countries are put into competition with each other at offering cheap, exploitable workforces. If Bangladesh doesn't give us cheap labor, we will go to Vietnam or we will go to Indonesia to find workers whom we can exploit. Again, a disaster that we don't have these labor standards. And then there is the big global tax system with its global haven industry, many tax havens which allow corporations from rich countries to avoid paying taxes anywhere in the developing world. The corporations like Apple and Google and so on, they just say, look, we have no profits in Africa. We have no profits in Brazil because they managed to shift their profits from the countries in which they really do business into countries in which no taxes need to be paid. Countries like the British Virgin Islands, the Bermudas, the Bahamas, uh, and so on and so forth, all these different tax havens. So these are just small examples of how our global economy is structured systematically in favor of the rich and thereby systematically structured against the poor. And this is what explains the persistence of poverty with which we started. You can see here how that has developed over time, how the global, the top global 1% now has four times more income than the bottom uh, 50%. And poverty essentially has persisted while the global top 1% has gotten richer and richer. Good, this is it for today. And I look forward to your questions and discussion. I will try to stop sharing my screen. 
Excellent, Professor uh, Thomas. Uh, so I would invite the students to all uh, make it their questions. Okay. Would you like to start? Please, Iago. First of all, thank you, Mr. Thomas. First of all, thank you, uh, Teacher Murilo, to make it happen. And my question uh, is, uh, let's make a game. I have all goodies in the world. What, uh, how can uh, we develop um, uh, the necessity to give this, to, to make a better division with other countries? I mean, if USA, for example, uh, I have the best economy, I have the best goodies, the best properties, and I have all um, gold in the world, for example. Why I will give, why I will share my goodies with another countries? Because when I say human rights, it's very beautiful, but why I will give for a Brazilian person, for, for example, if this person doesn't pay uh, tax for me, doesn't fight in my army, uh, doesn't uh, make us uh, uh, anything for me. You know, uh, what I mean uh, is how make this division possible in the world? You, you are with Professor Thomas. My mic is off. Okay. So I, I don't agree with your premise, right? The, the thing is that it's not just that the US is very, very rich. It is that the US is constantly exploiting the poor countries. So the US needs a lot of imports, uh, raw materials, uh, metals, for example. And these imports come from other countries. They come from Brazil, they come from Africa and so on. And the populations of these countries do not benefit from these exports to the United States and to Europe. And so the question really is, by what right are you Europeans and US citizens, by what right can you appropriate these resources with the consent of the rulers of those countries when you know that these resources or the value of these resources is not shared with the ordinary people. Right. So the way you describe the situation is exactly the way most people in the US see it. They say we are rich. We have worked hard. We are rich. Why should we share our hard earned money with poor people in other parts of the world? But that's not really the situation. The rich are constantly sucking up value from the poorer parts of the world. And the people who are the rightful owner of those resources do not get a share of it. Poor Brazilians don't get a share of the value that is lost every day when wood is exported, for example. Uh, Africans are not getting a share of the value of the metals and minerals and oil that is exported out of Africa. That is where you have the problem. We are constantly harming the poor and that's why we should pay attention unless you are a totally amoral person who says, if I have the power, why shouldn't I harm everybody? Why shouldn't I use it? You know, then you are Hitler. That's okay. You can say, uh, if I can conquer uh, Russia and all of Europe, of course I do it. Uh, slaughter all the people, uh, get the country for us. But most people in the US and in Europe think of themselves as being very moral and very civilized. And if they are moral and civilized, then they should stop exploiting populations in the poor parts of the world. They should institute a just and fair global economic order under which everybody can meet their basic needs at least. Thank you. Anybody else? I can make a question. Please. So Thomas, um... I wouldn't make an ordinary question of about your work, 
I think you listen to this question so many times. So in your articles, you defend a minimum criteria of justice based on human rights. The problem that people point to you is the, uh, what mean minimal. So we live in a world of a third of all deaths are related to poverty, right? And assessing human rights is a complicated tax because human rights, you know, you call minimal, but in the same time, human rights are uh, 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 complex and demanding. You know, it's not simple make human rights, access human rights. Human rights are complex, are demanding. So why you put human rights as a minimum? I'm asking you about the concept of minimum. Mm. Because uh, 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 another way, what do you think, uh, what is the maximum concept to you? I know you answer, we not have this answer now because the maximum concept of justice is not uh, uh, already done. But uh, what do you think we? What do you think is the path of the maximum concept of justice, and why human rights can be uh, um, treated as a, a, a minimum concept? I think well, you got. Yeah. This is a classic question, but I would like to ask you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, the concept of human rights, for better or worse, is the lingua franca of international politics, right? So uh, when you talk about global justice, uh, people will say it is, there's a lot of diversity of opinion. The Chinese have a different conception of global justice from the Europeans, from the Brazilians, from the Africans and so on. We don't have agreement yet. And that is maybe true but we do have agreement on one part of global justice. We have agreement that human rights must be or should be realized in the whole world. Everybody should at least have their human rights fulfilled. This is not my idea. This is out there and that every country has signed up to it. Every country is rhetorically committed to it. Not really, but rhetorically. And so I'm saying whatever global justice is, human rights are part of it. So then, uh, so it's a rhetorical argument. I'm not saying I have an idea, uh, let's do human rights. I'm saying you, it's your idea. You are talking about human rights all the time. So let's use human rights as a minimal standard. And I'm willing to take the human rights that the UN has agreed upon that governments themselves have said they want to live up to. So I'm saying you are recognizing these human rights every day in your rhetoric and you are violating these same human rights every day in your actions. So do live up to your own rhetoric. Right now, what would I say would be a reasonable, I would say, of course, human rights are a very, very minimal standard, a world in which people just barely have their human rights fulfilled while other people are very rich would still be a very unjust world, but it would be much, much better than ours. Now, what would I want? I won't want to see something. I think Rawls's difference principle is a pretty good principle that you say we want to organize the world economy in such a way that we can achieve as high as possible a lowest level that the poor, poorest people in the world are reasonably well off. And I think that would be good uh, on the one hand for people being able to live free, rich, fulfilling lives, even the poorest. And it would also be good for the political equality of people, right? Again, I come back to the topic of your seminar, which is citizenship. We want all the citizens, all the people in a globalized world, every human being should have a chance to influence how this world is structured. Nobody should be so marginalized economically that they cannot make their influence felt. So that's, again, a reason for the difference principle. If we keep inequalities relatively low, then everybody everywhere has a fair chance through their government or through other institutions, through their actions as uh, citizens to co-shape their 
national institutions, regional institutions, global institutions. So that would be my vision. But again, you know, if you don't share that vision, I would say, okay, fine. That's too strong for you. Fine. Let's go for human rights. There's plenty of work to do with human rights alone. Okay, anybody else? Uh, I would like to make a... Oh, please, Pedro. Hi, everyone. Um, hi, Mr. Thomas. Uh, you have a theor theory uh, about dividend from global research. In, in Portuguese, dividendo dos recursos yes. globais. Yes. Uh, do you believe that uh, our countries are offshore organizations that will be interested in this in this plan? Well, I, I've tried to propagate it with no success, right? It, it, there was a lot of resistance to it. I think that it is, uh, I'm totally convinced by it. I think it's a very good idea. And it, it is a good idea because it combines two different goals, the purpose of eradicating poverty and the purpose of saving the environment. So if we had instituted the global resources dividend when I proposed it in the 1990s, then immediately the price of damaging resources would have gone up. You know, oil would have become more expensive and so on. And at the same time, we would have created a payment flow to the poor people of the world. So the poor would have been more able to afford resources, even oil and so on, because their increase in income would have outpaced the price increase in natural resources or oil and so on. But we would have reduced, significantly reduced, uh, pollution and the consumption of polluting fossil fuels and so on. So this would have accelerated the transition to a green economy. And it would also easily have eradicated poverty. That's amazing, you know, that you have, again, that you have this enormous poverty that I was describing in a world where really nobody has any better claim to the wealth to the natural resources of the planet than anybody else, right? This planet was given to us in common. It belongs to all of us. And why should some people be allowed to harvest the value of the planet without sharing it with everybody else? The global resources dividend would just take 3% of that value, a small percentage of the value of all the resources extracted and channel it to the poor, I would say, why not 100%? Why not share all the resources? But even if you just share 3%, you can eradicate poverty that way. So, of course, it was a very good idea, but the people in power, they say, why should I? Nobody can force me, like Hitler, you know? Why should, why should I share? Nobody can force me to share, so I keep everything I can. Okay, anybody else, uh, a last question? Uh, so, uh, I will uh, do a small comment and uh, a very, very ordinary question that you probably okay. listen uh, so many times. Uh, I, I really like your normative approach, especially because of its political perspective. Because if we work in the... Uh, approach of existence and uh, and charity, uh, we are not uh, really changed the uh, political imbalance, the power imbalance in, in the world. Uh, when, we, as you do, we discuss uh, the the poverty from the perspective of uh, moral. Uh, obligation violations, uh, negative violation, as you put in your, your test. And when the, 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 the way to, to address it is not just assistance, but uh, uh, important reform of the, the global institutional arrangements, 
we are thinking about change the, the global power imbalance. It's really different than keep the, the powerful of the world uh, controlling the, the, the political relations. And uh, it's the same when we think in the national level, because uh, when we discuss uh, the morality in the national level, we always are talking, oh, I am rich and I am, but I am a good person because uh, I do my charity. I, I, but I'm not obligated to do it. The, the, the people think that, that in that uh, uh, way. And my, my question is about how to do, because your description of the, the word uh, poverty is, is really convincing. And the, your normative approach, for me, it's uh, also. But when we have uh, uh, so hard, difficult to, to convince even the poor, poor of the world, if the Brazilian people, that this is the, the way, uh, how to convince the, the American people, the European uh, people to do uh, uh, so? Uh, in, in some time, I, I, I don't know what to think about it, but the, everyone will believe that we have a, a kind of, of uh, global civil society uh, that will mobilize in the, the, uh, a global uh, public sphere, a global public opinion in this uh, direction, the direction of the reform, the global uh, governance. But uh, some uh, critics of this also say, oh, so, or, uh, the, peop the, the poor of the world are not representing this global uh, civil society. The, there are some people speaking in their, in their mm -hmm. names. And, and we've, we've been discussing uh, some uh, pieces in our uh, seminars about uh, this, this few, uh, these uh, questions. For example, from John Dreisack and Nancy Fraser, that there are different approaches, but both ones discussing this uh, global counter public. And uh, wh how, what do you think? How, how to. You are working it, right? You are try, working hard to disseminate this kind of idea to convince the, the people. But you recognize that they uh, are not having so, so much success in, in, in done with it. Uh, what, what do you expect for the near future? What to, could you, uh, may we uh, do in face of uh, considering this normative uh, uh, position that we sh you have shared with us uh, this morning? Yeah, excellent. This is the, the big, big question. So uh, two thoughts on that. Uh, so one is that I was somewhat naive in the past, right? I thought that if you make crystal clear to people who think of themselves as moral persons that they are doing something wrong, they will say, okay, I'm doing something wrong, I have to change. No, in most cases, people will find ways to convince themselves that somehow you know, they change their morality or they deceive themselves about the facts or whatever, but they will always find a way to avoid a conclusion that is costly for themselves. Not 100% of people, but the vast majority. So the human capacity for self-deception is just amazing. Now, that leaves us with one other strategy, and that is to find reforms that would shift the balance of power, but be beneficial to the rich, or at least not harmful to the rich. That means we have to find parts of the existing structure that are not only unjust, but also inefficient. If something is inefficient, then we can change it to make everybody better off. And that's what I've been trying to do in recent years. So in recent years, I've worked in particular on the intellectual property rights, on monopoly patents. Monopoly patents are amazingly inefficient. They are wasteful beyond belief. Billions and billions of dollars are wasted uh, because of intellectual property rights deadweight losses, enormous deadweight losses, right? The price is very high. Many people cannot buy something. And these people are lost as customers. You, you lose all these people, right, who, who would be willing to pay 
but you can't sell to them because your price is so high then you have all the patent litigation, enormous amounts of money that are wasted on lawyers, on advertising and so on. So if we can change that system, we can make it more efficient and thereby help not only the poor, but also the rich. So that has been my recent work in pharmaceuticals and green technologies to create these impact funds that would shift innovation rewards from monopoly patents to impact rewards. And if that works, we can subtly change the power distribution in favor of the poor without in any way hurting the rich, actually giving the rich more profit. So I say to the pharmaceutical companies, wouldn't you like to make money also in the developing world with poor patients? And I say to governments, wouldn't you like to eradicate diseases instead of only curing them for rich people? To eradicate a disease like COVID-19, we need to treat everyone. We can't just treat a few people, you know, we have to make a global strategy of treating the disease. And so I hope that governments and pharmaceutical companies will not resist that sort of reform. And then when we have that reform, it will shift the balance of power in favor of poorer populations. So I'm working on that now with a pilot in Africa that we want to do for the Health Impact Fund and also within the T20, which is the, you know, the G20. And this is important because next year, India will be the chair of the G20 and after India comes Brazil. So we hope that you can all help us get this and keep this on the G20 agenda, the reform of monopoly patents, not everywhere, but shift some of the more important goods over from the monopoly track to the impact fund track. Excellent. Many thanks. We will have a meeting just now, uh, and we have some minutes for our coffee. Uh, I, I'd like to, to say uh, thank you very much for you, Professor. My pleasure. Foggy, and for the students that uh, have uh, worked with us this morning. Bye-bye. Yeah. See you later. Thank you.